Uh, welcome to Crossroads Church today. It is good to see you. I want to uh, welcome all of you joining us online at uh Crossroads Live, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you might be, Fort Lupton, and of course here at Thornton. If you're new with us, uh, man, a special welcome to you. My name is Matt Manning, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting, and I am the senior pastor here at Crossroads, which just means that I get the privilege and the opportunity and the honor to serve this church by leading this church. And today I am pretty uh, jazzed because we are starting a brand new message series called Christianity for the Curious, the Cautious, and the Confused. Because let's be real, we know that when it comes to Christianity, it can be complex, can't it? Like it can feel so complicated at times. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a buddy of mine. He's not a believer. He's not a Christian. And I was telling him about this series. And he says, when it comes to Christianity, it feels like a fog is the way that he described it. He said, you know, when you like wake up in the morning and the heavy fog's kind of moved in and you're driving and you don't really know where you're at. You don't know where you're going. You can't really see. He goes, that's Christianity for me. And I thought, man, that is so insightful. And so really what this series is over the next six weeks is us taking a journey together with hopes of really lifting kind of the religious fog of Christianity so that we can see it as it actually is. Because the reality is that we know every week when we come together, there are some of you who are here and you would describe yourself as like curious. You would say, I'm here today and I'm here because I'm a curious person. I'm spiritually open, and you know that like inside you just know that there's like a God out there somewhere, but you're just not sure because of the fog of Christianity who that God is. I have a family member who would say it like this. He would sum up his beliefs like this. He says, you know, I know that there's a God, and when I open the Bible and read the scriptures, that it kind of makes sense that that God could be the God that's out there, but I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. If you're here today and you're curious, I want you to know that your curiosity is welcomed here. It's invited here in this place. For others of you, you're here today and you're tuning in online because somebody invited you. Maybe, you know, they promised to take you out to lunch afterwards to do like, you know, get yourself some chili. Or maybe it's a cute guy, cute girl that you've had your eye on and like, hey, if you go to church, like, you know, we'll go out. And so you're here today because you've been invited. But you walk into the space and you're walking in kind of cautiously, aren't you? That because of your experience, there's a quite a bit of skepticism of what we're all about and what we do in kind of church world. That maybe in your past, your past experiences, you went to a church when you were a kid that was harsh or you had some harsh Christian parents. You had bad experiences with, with, you know, with a family member who always talked about grace but rarely ever shared grace, showed grace. For others of you, you've kind of watched from a distance the hypocrisy that Christians live their lives with. And so you enter into a space like this and there's quite a bit of skepticism in your life. You're here but you're cautious. I just want you to know if that's you today, that we welcome your questions, that we welcome your skepticism, that we welcome your critiques here at Crossroads Church. For others of you, maybe you'd put yourself in the category of confused, whether you've been a believer like for a while or this is like brand new at church, you're just like, Matt, like, like I'm just confused. Like when it comes to Christianity, like how does it work? How does it fit together? What, you know, what's it all mean? And if that's you today, I just want you to know that you're in like really good company, all right? Statistically speaking, if you're a baby boomer, that's those of you born before 1965, that statistically only 35% of baby boomers can articulate the core uh, beliefs of Christianity, only 35%. Gen Xers, that's those of you born before 1980, that number goes down to about 25%. Millennials, if you're in my generation, that number shrinks all the way down to 4%. If you're Gen Z here today, like... You know, the data's not all in, but estimates, estimates are that only 1.8% of Gen Z can articulate the core beliefs of Christianity. Like there is a fog of confusion when it comes to Christianity. And so if you find yourself here today, identifying in, in one of those categories or all three of those categories, I want you to know that this sermon series is for you. Like I said, over these next six weeks, I'm going to invite you into a journey, and we're going to discover what Christianity is all about in hopes of lifting kind of the religious fog around Christianity so that we can see it as it actually is. And as we walk over these next six weeks, we're going to look at some tough topics, and we're going to answer some questions that people have, questions like this, like, why did Jesus come? Week two, we're going to look at what Christianity is ultimately all about. And week three, we're going to talk about the Bible and why we believe that it's actually that it actually proclaims truth. Week four, we're going to look at the nature of God. Then we're going to move on to the nature of man. And then we're going to wrap this all up with what does it look like to actually live out the Christian life? Like when it comes together, what does it look like for us actually to live as believers of this faith? And so that's the journey we're going to be on in the next six weeks. And today, we're going to start with what ultimately is the most fundamental question um, of Christianity. And that's this question. Why did Jesus come into this world? 
Why did Jesus come into this world? Have you ever thought about that question before? Whether you're a longtime believer or this is your first time at church, you probably have thought about this question. That there is something here that it is fundamentally the most important question that we can answer in this series. If we are going to understand Christianity, if we're going to, to lift the religious fog that hovers over Christianity, we have to be able to answer this question. Why did Jesus come into this world? How would you answer it? For some of you, you might raise your hand and go, oh man, that, that. like I believe that Jesus came into this world to be a great teacher. Like, do you know how amazing an answer that is? I mean, Jesus, the son of a carpenter, born in nowhere Israel with very little classical training, grows up to be this teacher of immense popularity, of immense influence, not only with like the people that he walks with, and not only in this like little country in the Middle East, but on the entirety of humanity. Amazing, isn't it? Jesus came to be teacher. For others of you, you'd raise your hand, and if you know, you maybe you've been in church for a while, and you go, Matt, this one's easy. Like Jesus came into this world to save us. I mean, we could spend our entire lives pondering and thinking on that answer, can't we? Like, is it even possible for a man to come and to save the entire world? Like, like is that even doable? And if Jesus is God, then how in the world, why in the world would the God of the universe leave his throne room of majesty and honor and glory and come into this world to save us? I mean, every week when we gather, we gather to ponder, to think, to try to make sense of that statement, Jesus came to save us. For others of you, you might, you might who maybe you've studied the scriptures a little bit more, and you would go, Matt, like the reason that Jesus came into the world is because to bring to fulfillment what was written about him in the Old Testament. I mean, just pause and think of how important that is for a moment. That Jesus came into this world to fulfill the law and all that the prophets spoke about him. I mean, if that's really true, that that means that there's actually a plan here. That this isn't just by accident, that there's purpose here. That this isn't just some guy like proclaiming stuff, but there's something really going on here. To fulfill all that is written, oh, that is a heavy, heavy answer. For others of you, you would go, oh, man, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, you know, where Jesus says that I've come to set the captives free. To set the captives free. I mean, what greater purpose is there to come alongside people who are in handcuffs that they don't even know that they have on and to deliver them? To come to those who are, who are imprisoned in enemy occupation and to give them freedom. There are very few greater purposes in this world than to set the captives free. The reality is, is that you and I, that we could spend an entire day just talking about why Jesus came. But did you know that Jesus actually answered this very question? And he did so very specifically and very objectionably. And he did it in John chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and turn to John chapter 18. You can open your Bible apps there. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We're all going to put it on the screen here in just a few moments. But as you turn there, kind of let me set the scene for you. That Jesus is standing before a man named Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate was a governor, a Roman governor, over a place called Judea. And Judea, think of as like a state in Israel. Okay? And Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate because he's on trial. And the reason that he's there on trial is because through the course of Jesus' ministry, he had this, this, this uh, teaching where he would teach people that he was the Messiah. He would say that he was the Son of God. And over several years, this really just irritated the religious leaders. In fact, they considered, when Jesus said that he was the Son of God, that they considered this ultimate blasphemy. Eventually, they got to the point where they were fed up. And they went to Pontius Pilate, and they said, hey, there's this guy named Jesus. He's wandering the streets in Jerusalem, and he's telling everybody he is the Son of God. Now, in Roman culture, to say that you were the Son of God was to equate yourself to being king. And in Roman civilization, there was one king, and his name was Caesar. That this was a capital offense. And so Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate, and his life is literally in Pilate's hands. To be found not guilty means that he gets to walk away free and clear and live his life. To be found guilty means that he would face death by crucifixion. That everything's riding on this trial. 
Now this trial starts kind of in the middle of the night, and as it moves through the night, Jesus barely utters a word. For eight, nine hours, Jesus doesn't say anything. And as the dawn begins to come, as, as you know, the night fades away and, and day shows up, Jesus begins to speak. It's where we pick up the story in verse 33. In John chapter 18, it says this, So Pilate entered his headquarters and again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Like, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this out of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Man, am I a Jew? Like, am I a Jew? Your own nation your own nation, and the chief priests, your religious leaders, they're the ones who brought you here. They delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And then Pilate said to him, so... (laughs) So you're saying that you are a king. And Jesus replied with these profound words. You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. And here's what he says. To bear witness to the truth. In other words, what Jesus is saying is the reason that he came into this world is so that you and me, so that we would know truth. Like, Like there's something going on here. There's something important that we need to see here. That if we're going to understand Christianity, if the fog is going to lift, then it'll be because we have wrestled with truth. That truth is is the linchpin in bringing understanding to what we are seeking. Now, if I was to tell you that this week that I was called to be a witness, where would you guess that I was hanging out? Anybody? Yeah, the court, the courthouse. That's exactly it, that, that I would have been at the courthouse, that culturally we understand how this works. A few years ago here at Crossroads at our community center, our roof was in need of repair. A storm had moved through, as it is custom in Colorado to have n- nasty storms that just rip apart roofs. That happened to us. Well, it was really expensive, and our insurance agency decided that it was too expensive for them to pay, so they just dropped us. Well, the contractor's doing the work, and eventually the contractor has to sue the uh, insurance agency in order to get paid. And Chip Case, who is our community director for uh, the community center, was called several times to bear witness to what was going on in our situation. That culturally, we understand how this works. So what Jesus is implying here is that there is a trial going on. That there is a trial that's happening. And he's not necessarily talking about the current trial that he's in, standing before Pilate, that will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. Well, that's a part of it. It's not all of it. He said that there is a trial going on, and it's been going on as long as time itself. And what's on trial is truth. That Jesus says to Pilate in this moment, for this reason I have come, to bear witness to the truth. Now, if you've ever sat down and read the Gospels, that's the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the accounts of Jesus's life. If you've ever sat down and and read those gospels, then you are familiar with seeing Jesus on the witness stands in this trial of truth. If you've read the gospels, you've probably come across the phrase uh, that Jesus echoes where he says, I tell you the truth. 75 times in the four gospels, Jesus says these words, for I tell you the truth. When we zoom in to one of the Gospels, say the Gospel of John, we see Jesus sitting on the witness stand more vividly and more clearly. Like in John chapter 1, verse 17, where, where John writes these words, For the law was given to Moses, or through Moses, but grace and truth, they came through Jesus Christ. That Jesus is, is here on the, on the witness stand. Later in John 17, 17, Jesus is praying And he prays these words, sanctify them in the truth, that your word is truth. What Jesus is saying is that your your set-apartness, your holiness, your justification, that it is grounded in truth and that the Bible, the word of God, is truth. 
In John 8, 32, we have the most famous words that Jesus ever spoke when it came to truth. When he looks out and he says, you will know the truth and the truth, it'll set you free. That at least according to Jesus, the thing that causes us to be in captivity, the thing that causes us to be in handcuffs is lies. It gives all new meaning to those of you who would have raised your hand and said, Jesus came, right, out of Luke chapter 4 to set the captives free. Jesus says that when it comes to our captivities, that we are captive because of our lives, but it's the truth that ultimately sets us free. In John 14, 6, Jesus would say to his disciples these words. He says that I am the way, that I am the truth and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. That most all of us here, believer or not, kind of understand when Jesus says that I'm the way, that we know that he's, what he's trying to say there is that there's only one way to heaven. That on the, the mountain of faith, there's not, you know, many trails that are heading up. There's one trail, and his name is Jesus. And if you've been around church world, you could probably explain what it means when Jesus says that, that he is the life. That, that Jesus is the one who gives life, and he gives it abundantly. But what does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus is the truth? That's an important question that we need to answer. And so Jesus is standing before Pilate, and he looks at Pilate, and he says these words in chapter 18, verse 31, he, or 37. He says this. He says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is Jesus implying here? What is Jesus saying? What he's communicating to us is that there are actually sides to this. There are actually sides when it comes to this trial. Go all the way back with me to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the creation account, and in the creation story, most scholars believe that when, before God created everything that we can kind of see, everything that we experience, before he created the world that we know, he first started with the heavenlies. That God created the heavenly realm, and in it, he populated with these beautiful beings that we call angels. That the angels are there as, as God starts to create the universe by just speaking it into existence. That was just his very words. He speaks the universe into existence, and the angels are all standing there, and they're standing there in awe of what God is doing. On the sixth day, God gets his hands dirty. He gets down in the dirt. He begins to form man. He breathes life into man. Again, the heavenlies are in awe. Now, most biblical scholars believe that when it comes to Satan, the one that we call the devil, that before the fall of Genesis chapter 3, that Satan actually had a place of honor beside God. Like like he was in the courtroom with God, that he was the commander over the angels. Like that was his duty. That was his job. It was a place of honor. And I just kind of imagine in this moment as, as God is bringing life into humanity, that Satan leans over to God and says, what will they do? And God smiles at Satan and says, I'm, I'm making them a free will to worship me. And Satan looks at God and says, how can they choose if they don't have choice? Let me give them another choice and let's see if they choose to worship you. Now, that's all speculation on my part, but the next thing that we see in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes slithering in, doesn't he? And he goes to Eve and he says, he says, Eve, did God really say not to eat of that tree? Did God really say that? You know that if you eat of that tree, surely you're not going to really die. In fact, you're going to become like God. You're going to be your own God. And in this moment, all of creation is holding its breath. That Satan has raised up another truth claim. And all of creation is holding its breath as it waits for humanity to choose the truth claims of Satan or the truth claims of God. What will it be? Well, if you know the story, unfortunately, man chooses poorly. And the rest of the book unfolds. The point standing before Pilate is that Jesus looks at him and he says, there are sides here. There are sides in this trial. And Pilate looks at him in verse 38, and he says these words, what is truth? I mean, come on, that's the question of our day, isn't it? What is truth? How do we know truth? 
And what I find so interesting in, in this conversation is culturally speaking, how we think the way that we view the world is somehow new and fresh. Like we come up with words like postmodernism or neo-modernism or metamodernism. If you're not familiar with those words, they all come from a philosophy where the belief is that there was a time in history when people all agreed on truth, that it was objective, that you could, that you could know truth. It's what we call the age of modernism. And behind that philosophy is that after World War II, in the 60s, of seven, in the 60s and 70s, there was this cultural shift that happened in the Western world, in Western Europe, in the United States, and first world countries, that there was this shift that began to happen where skepticism began to grow around truth. And no longer could you, could, did art have the ability to create meaning. Or, or history had the ability to, to convey truth, to reveal truth or for language, the ability to convey reality. That eventually, the way this philosophy goes, eventually that that skepticism became the norm. It became the norm. Now, that philosophy is good and well in a very interesting philosophical, uh, philosophical discussion, but it is also so microscopic in its perspective. What it fails to account for is that throughout human history, humanity has always questioned it has always wrestled with its ability to know truth. In Genesis chapter 3, in AD 32, here's Jesus standing before Pilate, and Pilate asked the question, what is truth? If we went out into our communities today and asked the question, what is truth, there would be a variety of answers. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been asking that question to some people that I've been running into, and here's been some of their responses. One person said, I know that we disagree, but you have your truth and I have my truth. We can all say different things because we each have our own truth. I love the way you speak your truth. Truth is what you make of it. The truth in our culture today, the way that we see it, is we see it as, as relative. And it's no wonder that we find ourselves so curious, isn't it? It's no wonder we find ourselves so confused when it comes to Christianity that everybody seems to believe that they have their own truth. But when Jesus comes into the world, he says that I've come to bear witness to the truth, and in doing so, he makes this the core issue that we have to wrestle with. That in my opinion, there is no greater person, uh, no greater question a person can ask than the question, what is truth? So very simply, what is it? What's the definition? Well, when it comes to it, truth is a faithful representation of reality as it is. That truth is a faithful representation of reality as it actually is. So let's take this out of the philosophy terms, all right? And let's make this a little bit more concrete. Let me give you an example. And let's use the Broncos as an example, right? Our Denver Broncos, they're one and one, right? Big Sunday night game tonight. San Francisco's in town. Jimmy G's back, right? Like big game tonight. Now, anybody with eyes, anybody with eyes can see in the first two games that the Broncos are having trouble snapping the ball on time, right? You spend three timeouts by midway in the fourth quarter to avoid delay of game, uh, delay of game penalties. You got problems, don't you? And last week, if you were watching the game or if you were there in the stadium, the conversation in the stadium was not, you have your truth and I have my truth. No, we saw 70,000 plus fans start to chant in unison, counting down the, the clock, the play clock, in order for the Broncos to snap it on time, right? Like, like the faithful representation of reality as it actually is, is that the Broncos are terrible at game day operations. Like we all agree on that. That's absolute. The truth is a faithful representation of reality as it is. So I want you to step back for a moment, and I just want you to ponder this with me. Because if you're here today, and you believe that there is a God, then God alone is ultimately real. That he is, that he is ultimate reality. If there really is a God, then that means that there's nothing before him, and there's no other entity that's forming reality, that all reality is formed by him. By the very nature of his being, he has determined and defined for us what is real, what is reality. The very concept of truth depends on the concept of what is real. 
And since what makes something true is that it corresponds with what is real, therefore God determines and defines all truth. So when Jesus prays in John chapter 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth, what he's saying that is, is if you want to know truth, listen to the Father. If you want to know what truth is, listen to God. If we want to know truth, go to the words that God has spoken. Now I realize that even that as I say this, the simple affirmation that there is absolute truth is both controversial and stunning in our culture. That it's met with widespread disbelief. I mean, if you try to go out and claim today that there is absolute truth, a truth that everybody should believe, and that everybody should follow, that you will be regarded as misguided in this world. Because if there really is a God, how can we know who he actually is? I mean, isn't just one person's opinion of God just as valid as someone else's? And on top of that, to claim that there is absolute truth leads to intolerance and prejudice against what other people think. It's why John 14, 6 is so profound. When Jesus looks out at his disciples and he says, I am the truth. Now, in Jesus' time, this was a controversial statement. Don't lose sight of that. It may be more so today in our world, but it was was controversial in Jesus' day. That Jesus is in this intimate moment with his disciples. They're sitting in what's called the Last Supper. They're eating this last meal with Jesus. And as they're eating the last meal, Judas, one of Jesus' bud, gets up and he runs out of the room. And everybody in the room knows that Judas is leaving to betray Jesus. It's this tender moment. And in this tender moment, Jesus leans in and he begins to share with his disciples the plan of the cross. He's going to die. Listen, this is it for him. It's going to happen. He's going to die. And as he begins to share this with the disciples, the disciples start to freak out. Like anxiety and worry just fill the room. It's so thick that you could cut it with a knife. And they're just, they're just there fretting over what's next. They're fretting for their friend. They're concerned about Judas who's running off to betray him. Like all of this, what's going to happen to them? Like all of this is in the room. And Jesus, on the eve of the crucifixion, leans into his disciples with care. And he begins to speak a tender word to them, encouraging them, sharing that it's going to be okay. And about halfway through this tender moment, Thomas, doubting Thomas, the one full of skepticism and critique, comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how in the world are we going to know the way? We don't even know where you're going, man. And Jesus answers him with these words. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, for us who are Christians, who are Christians, we totally lose sight of how significant this is. That Jesus in this moment says, I am the truth. And with these words, Jesus makes a claim that separates Christianity from every other truth claim in the world. Every other belief system in the world. That when Jesus walked on this earth, he claimed to be God. All other religions of the world have a founder who claim, who claim that they are a prophet who can show you the way to God. But Jesus comes into this world claiming to be God and says, you don't have to, I'm not going to take you to find God. I'm looking for you. I'm coming for you. That Jesus in this moment is claiming to so fully embody God that he is actually God that he is ultimate reality, that he is what is real, and that when he speaks, he speaks truth. He speaks faithfully that which represents reality, what is real. Now, why this is so important, why this is so important is because Jesus, in Jesus claiming to be God, he puts himself at odds with every other truth claim, every other religion, every other belief system who just have a prophet. Which means that when Jesus makes this statement, he's either crazy and he's wrong, like he's insane. And by the way, do you know what the definition of insanity is? It's the loss of touch with reality. 
If Jesus has lost touch with reality, then it means that therefore his claims on truth are inferior to every other truth claim out there, and he's nothing more than a liar. Or he is God, and he is way superior to every other truth claim, every other religion, every other belief system, and he is actually who he says he is. Listen, if you believe that Jesus is God, then God himself has forced you into a corner, and you have to choose. He either is who he says he is, or is not. He's either a liar, or is the ultimate truth teller. But it cannot be both. That Jesus, according to the scriptures, enters into the world as the ultimate reality and the perfect champion of truth. It's God's final and decisive way of saying that truth is not impossible for us to reach. That truth is within our grasp. That it has come to us. That he's willing to chase after us in order for us to find it. And the question is, is do we believe it? Do we believe that? I mean, as we come to a close here, As we come to a close here, for a moment, I just want you to think about the words, the the big words in Christianity, words like like trust and hope and and believe and faith, the big words of, of Christianity. Like, what does it mean to have faith? Are we just people of faith because we have faith? Like, are we just people of hope because we're wishing something great's gonna happen? Like, like no. Like there's a thread throughout Christianity. That we, have put our, that we have put our faith in the truth claims of God and the one who professes those truth claims. That our trust is in the promises of God, that what God has promised, he will deliver on. That our hope is in the fact that God has invaded this world, dying on the cross for our sins, rising again three days later so that we might have life and have it abundantly. That our trust is that in knowing the truth that we will be set free. The question is, is do you believe it? That you have an opportunity to believe the claims of Jesus. That he is who he says he is. The way, the truth, and the life. If you're ready to accept that today, I want to pray for you. Would you bow your head with me? Father, We know that your presence is here. And Father, in a culture who who wrestles just as Pilate did, as a culture of your day with what is truth, Lord, I am so grateful that you are so clear, that you are so concise, that you're so objective with why your son came into this world so that we might know truth. And so Father, today I pray for those. I pray for those, Lord, who are who are seeing you as you are. The one who came so that we might know truth. That we would see ourselves clearly because of the way that you've spoken as sinful and in need of a savior. That we would see you for who you are, the one who came and lived a perfect life, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of those sins. And as we put our faith in you, as we put our weight on you, Lord, we trust that you will deliver us from our sins, that you will forgive us of our sins, and in doing so, that you call us children of God. And in that, we have life and we have it abundantly. In that, we find the freedom to live. And so, Lord, I pray that as you whisper to people today, Lord, as they stand before the cross, Lord, that they would come humbly with their sins, knowing that they can't hide anything from you, asking for the forgiveness, and doing so, receiving your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for being an amazing and awesome God. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Today, we gather together And we remember Jesus' sacrifice through what we call communion. That Jesus, when he's with his disciples, 
in that moment where Judas leaves, he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body broken for you. The truth is, is that you have sin that you cannot pay for and it separates you from God. And Jesus says, by my body being broken, you can have that relationship that you seek with God again, that you can know him. And so today, we eat of the bread together as a family, remembering Jesus' sacrifice. And with the cup, he says, this is the cup of your salvation. As you drink it, know that you are free. And so we drink our freedom today. I'm gonna invite you to stand. We're gonna continue in our worship and song. In the course of the next 20 minutes or so, if you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. You can make your way over to the banner online. You can click the button. But let's sing to Jesus, our good Lord and Savior today. As we continue.